Hi, I'm Shane, and this is part three of my talk on effective instruction tuning, data methods, and new abilities. So in this part of the talk, we're going to focus on the trade-offs in selecting instruction tuning or alignment tuning data. So the first practical question is whether or not the data that you choose will have permissive or restrictive licensing, and this will affect the ways in which you can deploy your model, for instance, whether you can um, use it for commercial purposes. And secondly, what types of tasks will your model excel in? So there are more traditional NLP tasks, and the performance in those might be different from performance for more open-ended, creative, dialogue-centric generation, like your chatbot or chat GPT. Um, and then there are other trade-offs, obviously, to consider, and I, I'm not going to enumerate them all, but one might be monolingual versus multilingual capabilities. And then there are others like what domains you might uh, perform well in, such as social media or news or uh, biomedical tasks. So let's focus on the first one, permissive or restrictive licensing. So it's very popular in the last few months um, with models like Alpaca to generate data using ChatGPT, a proprietary model, and take the outputs and sometimes the inputs generated by ChatGPT to train your own model um, with that data to emulate this much better proprietary model. But although I'm not a lawyer, um, there are some implications of this. If we look at the OpenAI terms of use, section 3A says actually that uh, users are given all rights, title, and interest in the output of the model, including for commercial purposes, as long as they comply with the uh, terms of use. And there's one particular restriction in section 2C that's uh, relevant, and that's that you may not use output from the services to develop models that compete with OpenAI. So it requires some legal advice to interpret compete, but it seems to rule out any sort of commercial application and potentially other applications. The second trade-off to consider um, is what types of tasks your data would be oriented around and therefore your model would perform well in. So I've just separated these uh, into two sets of tasks uh, for simplicity. But uh, as you can see on the left, NLP tasks are more academic in nature. They focus on specific question answering, factual um, data sets, multiple choice exams, or some types of common sense reasoning, et cetera. Whereas creative generous, uh, generation tasks or more diverse in nature. They focus on dialogue or chit chat or things like poetry or humor generation, as well as explanation and planning. NLP tasks also tend to have short and deterministic answers in most cases, so that it's easy to evaluate automatically with heuristics or string matching. Uh, whereas creative generation tasks, they tend to have long and open-ended answers where it's subjective, which set of answers might be better than another or whether or not um, it's sufficiently answered a given question or prompt. And NLP tasks are also, they tend to be very well curated and focus on a specific ability uh, and they attempt to be quite challenging. Whereas creative generation tasks are subjective and open in nature um, and are evaluating many things at once often. So, Although this isn't fully empirically supported or, or very well documented, we seem to be seeing a, a something called an alignment tax or a trade off. And it's discussed a little bit in the Instruct GPT paper, although they didn't pro don't provide many details. What we're seeing is that certain models that are trained on academic benchmarks like FLAN T5, FLAN POM, T0, MT0, Llama I, they do exceptionally well on NLP tasks, um, getting state of the art on a lot of benchmarks. But creatively and for open generation, they don't seem to have as good a freeform dialogue and chat that we see in something like ChatGPT. But uh, there have been some work recently that's shown that in almost 80% of cases, the best models for most individual non-creative tasks, uh, like some sort of classification, come from those models and not creative models like ChatGPT. But uh, if what we care about are more creative, open-ended generation and, and dialogue, then um, recent models like Alpaca, Koala, Dolly V2, Visuna, they're doing exceptionally well in those cases, often because they're distilled from creative models like ChatGPT. And although it hasn't been uh, evaluated uh, sufficiently, they don't appear 
at a first glance to do quite as well on NLP benchmarks because their data is not oriented in that direction as much. And I've put a slightly different color and moved uh, GPT 3.5 and so chat GPT, GPT 4 into the middle because in the Instruct GPT paper, they do say that they mix together uh, additional pre-training objectives to try to compensate for this tax and find some sort of middle ground. And so future research is required to say whether this alignment tax is something that still persists when you combine more academic and creative data or whether it can be overcome with other methods. But for now, we see many of the competing uh, models having slightly different performance properties. In terms of other trade-offs, although there's many examples, I'll focus on the monolingual versus multilingual one, which I think will become more prevalent in the coming uh, years. Um, as we expand ChatGPT and other models to more languages, is there's things called, um, or there's certain trade-offs such as the curse of multilinguality, which says usually the per language performance can diminish as we add new training languages to a model. In other words, the best model for some language is one that focuses primarily on training data in that language. And um, that results in a tension or trade-off between how multilingual or diverse its capabilities are versus how strong they are in one language. So um, given the, the first two points in these trade-offs, the licensing and the types of tasks that the model does well on, you can kind of construct a, a diagram to show that there's a, a correlation lately. So on the y-axis, we have how permissive versus restrictive the licensing of the data and therefore the trained model is. And then the x-axis, we have more academic, instructive, or functional tasks, and then more creative dialogue and chatty tasks on uh, to the right. Now, quick disclaimer, um, this is looking at very new data sets. And so um, it's not comprehensive. It's not been fully verified with the full set of research and, and analysis, empirical uh, results. And obviously, I'm not a lawyer, so this isn't... Um, isn't uh, completely justified on the legal axis, but it's an initial look at what we can see from their licenses and the distribution of data. So on the left-hand side, more instructional, instructive and functional tasks are comprised of academic benchmarks. So large parts of supernatural instructions, the FLAN and P3 benchmarks, they have licensing that's more restrictive, but parts of them also in the FLAN collection do have a mix of Apache, MIT, and other licenses, uh, meaning that some of them could even be used for commercial use. And among these, um, the chain of thought and dialogue portions of those collections are a little bit more on the creative chatty end than the instructive uh, and functional end. But then we see in the bottom right-hand side, a whole new set of data sets um, that are very popular, including Self-Instruct, Alpaca, ShareGPT, that are all um, using OpenAI outputs uh, or outputs from their, their API from ChatGPT or, or Text da Vinci. And what that means is that the non-compete clause that we saw earlier comes into play and affects uh, how this data can be used. And there are other sets here that with similar um, derivations from OpenAI. And then the Stanford Human Preferences uh, data set is pulled from Reddit, which has its own um, new terms of service. And we expect to see many more distillation data sets in the bottom right, just because this is this method is working very well. And um, it's possible that there's a lot more innovation to be had here to distill better, smaller models from uh, proprietary models. In the top right hand side, we see um, sort of the underappreciated heroes, which have open sourced uh, their data in green. Um, such as Dolly, the 15K instructions, which are uh, full of the same distribution as InstructGPT, uh, some of Anthropic's data sets and the Open Assistant data sets, which have uh, more lenient licensing like CCSA or MIT, um, and then parts of the Leon uh, Open Instruction Generalist um, compilation of tasks as well. And so, what does this mean? In the short term, I think that the types of models that can be developed in the community are different depending on what types of uh, usage you have in mind. So anybody can right now go and train a model using some of these open source data sets and parts of the Flan collection to create 
a model that could be used openly for commercial use or any other use that they have in mind. Um, and then for a research model for non-commercial use, all those same data sets are available plus more and a lot of the distillation tasks, which are much more currently creative in nature than what's available um, for more open models. So for the community to catch up to OpenAI and Google and many of the proprietary models, I think that there's going to have to be more development of creative data sets um, that are more open use and have less restrictive licensing. Thank you so much for listening uh, to this talk. And if you enjoy material like this, I will be uh, posting similar content on Twitter. Thank you very much.